We are, obviously, we finished up a series last week on talking about the authority that God has given us. And so we're not really starting a new series, but we are going to be doing kind of a two-part this weekend and next weekend, sharing with you something I believe will really, really grab your heart and connect and help as we go into a new year. Isn't it hard to believe we're headed into a a new year? Um, I want to start off with this thought. How many of you love to get an email? Not from like the IRS, but like a friend. You like, you like to get, I know you're, you go on Facebook, you love it when you get a message or, how many have ever heard of email? I mean, okay, so how many of you still, you're into the envelope, you like, you, you, you lick the stamp and you do it that way. Is there anybody? Yeah, a few of you, okay. Um, some of you maybe are past email and you're all about the text or Snapchat or what have you, but let's say it's exciting when you get a message, right, from someone you want to get a message from. So let's say that you got an email, and when the email came in or the text came in, you know how you always look down to see who it is? What if it was from Jesus? So you would either be A, really excited, or B, oh no, right? (laughs) But but let's say you got an email, and let's say that it read this way. And and so what, what if the email read this way? I'm impressed with how your faith has grown. I appreciate how faithful you serve at LifePoint. I've taken notice of how you live free from the sin that's in the culture around you, but I have an area that disappoints me. You have abandoned your passion for me. How would you feel if you got an email like that? There's some good things you're, you're, you're serving. Some of you serve three services. You're, some of you work in the parking lot. You're working back in the kids' ministry, and you're really growing in your faith. You're not giving in to all the culture standards. You're, you're taking a stand, but... I have something that disappoints me that you've actually walked away from your first love. I mean, that'd be kind of a thought-provoking email to get. But in the book of Revelation, there is a letter from John to the church of Ephesus that sounds very similar to this. And Ephesus was a very important church. It was in a large Roman city. It was a church that was under a lot of persecution. There's actually uh, a famous road there called the Road of the Martyrs. So there's great persecution, but it it, it was a good church. And so listen to how John describes a message from Jesus to this church. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. So the lampstands, every church has a light. Every church has a lampstand. And Jesus is the one who walks among the lampstands. So verse two says this, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You can't bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they are apostles, but they're not. And you found them out to be liars. And you have persevered and you have patience and you've labored for, ne- for my name's sake, and you haven't become weary, nevertheless. You know, there's the good news, but. But nevertheless, I have something against you. You have left your first love. So remember where you from, from where you've fallen. Repent and do those first works, or else I'm going to come quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you would repent. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty strong email to say that, hey, this church is, it's, it's standing steadfast and it's going forward. Man, they got a lot of good servants there and they're growing in their faith and they're withstanding persecution, but they've left their first love. So I wanna, I wanna teach this scripture to you today and I realize that a lot of people when they preach this scripture, they're very condemning. And so I don't want to preach it in a condemning way. I just want you to open your hearts and open your minds today and just say, how passionate am I? Or have I maybe left my first love? So let's pick some of these words apart here and and we'll dissect this scripture and, and, and get to where we need to go today. So the Bible says this, you've left your first love. So that phrase, first love, means a passionate, uninhibited, fervent, honeymoon type of love. In other words, remember back when you first got married, they call it the honeymoon stage. 
where it was all warm and fuzzy and it was all love and you would do anything for them and they'd do anything for you. You know, that type of love that um, you didn't care who knew, you wanted everyone to just that. I mean, some of you gotta think way back, right? Some of you gotta think, like, I mean, get through the fog, remember. I'm just saying that that's the type, it's that first love. This is what John is writing, a message from Jesus to this church. And he said, you have left your honeymoon fervent uninhibited. What he's, saying, what he's saying is you've left your passion. Everybody say passion. passion. Now here's something I noticed about people that are really, really in love. One, they really, really like to always talk to person, right? You're in love. You just want to talk to them. And it's so much easier today. Now, I, 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 okay, I know I look old. I'm old school, but I was actually around before there were texts and emails, right? There was actually back then, so you couldn't call up and be like, Hey, what's up? How you doing? You, you, had to, you had to pull up at a gas station, <clears throat> get a quarter out of your pocket, put it in the phone, and call. That's, that's, that's how we used to roll. Unimaginable, I know. But, 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 but so people that are in love, they always just want to talk to the person, or they always want to uh, be with the person all the time, or all they want to do is talk about the person. So I remember back, you, you had a friend, and they were in love. And all they wanted to do was be with that person or they just wanted to talk to that person or they wanted to talk about that person all the time. So they would tell you how awesome that person was and you're like, I know this person, they're really not that awesome. But they thought they were awesome, right? Remember that person, right? But, but it's just this love thing that the Bible is comparing a honeymoon or that stage of love to a first love that he is describing here that we should have for Jesus, and so a lot of people will say, well, you don't have to be, you know, that on fire or, you know, just calm down. It's not, you don't have to be that intense. And, but we find out that Jesus is talking about a real passionate love affair with him. So passion in the Bible means fire. So it would be accurate to say that God really, really wants us to be on fire for him. So the word passion would mean that you keep your passion for God, it means to have it at the boiling point, to be fervent, to be hot. And passion is always something that gets ignited. In other words, it's a response to a stimuli. If you take a match and you strike it, you get what? Fire. And so it would be um, when you first saw that lady, guys, and something inside of you was like, mm, how you doing? It's, it's, it's that thing that's ignited. Or if you're a sports fan for your favorite team, there's something that's ignited. You guys know I'm a big Steeler fan. And so um, I'm really excited. You know, I'm, we had a few Ravens fans in the first service. Um, they're not going to heaven, but we're praying for them. <laughs> but they, whoever, I'm serious about that. Whoever your, your team is. Whoever your team is, or you, 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 you get me. There's something that is stimulated, and a response is passion. I mean, think about the sports world. There are going to be some stadiums today where it's two below zero, and it's snowing, and there are those passionate fans without their shirts on, their faces painted. and there, there's, So this means an uninhibited expression of your first love. It's something that is ignited. And let me say this to you. That's how God wants us to be. When you're passionate, that's the real you. Because God made us to be in a passionate relationship with him. But here, you got to hear this. You determine how passionate you're going to be for Jesus. No one, God doesn't determine it. Guess who determines it? You determine it and I determine it. But God wants us. And he says in this letter, you've left your first love. You've left the intimacy. You've left the fire. You've left the passion. And, and, and there was a lawyer one time that asked Jesus a question. The Jewish, uh, Jewish ha people had uh, 613 laws, and they divided them between the heavy laws and the light laws. And so a lawyer was asking Jesus, trying to trick him, and he said, what's the most important out of all 613 of those laws? And Jesus said, well, that's easy. The most important is love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind. Your soul. What was he saying? Love God with all of your passion. So if you're passionate that means God has your allegiance, he has your attention, and he has your affection. And this is what John's writing this letter to this church. He said, hey, you're serving, you're on the team, you're connected, you're in a group, you're a part of this, you're part of that, your, your faith is growing, you're learning. But he's warning that you can actually leave your first love. Now, when a lot of people preach this, they preach that you can lose your first love. But it doesn't say lose your first love. It says, or lose it, it says you leave it. 
they left, it means to abandon, as if a husband would abandon his wife. It's, it's, that, it's that thought or that idea that you have abandoned your first love. Well, let me give you this example. I am famous for saying this about five out of the seven days of the week. I can't find my keys. I lost my keys. Anyone like me, you just lose stuff all the time? Actually, I do it so much, I have this little thing on my key ring, and I have an app, so all I have to do is push the app, and it buzzes until I find my keys. But I was thinking, I've never actually really lost my keys. I've left my keys somewhere. So if I say, oh, I lost my keys, they're in the downstairs room. I didn't really lose them, I left them there. And so John is saying the same thing. It's not that you lose your first love, but you can leave it somewhere. But here's the deal. It's a process. No one wakes up and be like, I think I'll I'll leave my first love today. I think I'll just walk away. I'll abandon my wife today. No one does that. It's a process, and it happens deceptively, and sometimes it happens slowly. So all of a sudden, you realize that the fire was not what it once was. Now, if you read a couple of chapters over in Revelation, it talks about another church that is the result of leaving your first love. It's the church of Laodicea. And John wrote this to the hymn. He said, well, I've got, Jesus has this against you. You're actually not hot and you're not cold. You're lukewarm. And the scripture says, Jesus says, I'll spit you out of my mouth. How many of you would love to get up and take a lukewarm shower? Well, no one wants lukewarm, right? (laughs) But Jesus said the same thing. If you're lukewarm, it's distasteful to me. And the reason why that scripture, that church is referenced because where Laodicea was, there was fresh cold water springs and there was natural hot water springs that met in the city there. And by the time it came together, it was, guess what? Lukewarm. And Jesus said, I'd actually, you be cold than lukewarm. But I want you hot. And that's the result of leaving our first love. So our first love is this honeymoon, uninhibited expression of our passion for God. So I want to talk about the process of how it happens because it can happen to any church and it can happen to any believer. So it's not one of these services where I want you to like text someone and say, you need to watch uh, the live stream because this, you need to hear this. I want you to say, what's God speaking to me today? Because it's easy to say, well, such and such should hear this. Or I, but what any of us, myself included, can walk away from our passion. We can be serving with no passion. We can be growing with no passion. So here's my title today. It's Fireproofing Your Passion. Fireproofing your passion. So here's how this process goes. I'm gonna, I think it's gonna be a little eye-opening for you, but what puts out your fire? So this represents a fire. I really wanted to light this, but those of us who are more safety conscious than me, which is most of you, um, wouldn't let me light this. But let's say this is your fire, and it's blazing, it's passionate. Remember when you first fell in love with your spouse, it was just on fire. Remember when you first came to Jesus, man, and you're just on fire, and you, you just wanted to work. Here, here's where your fire shows or your passion shows. It shows in your worship, it shows in your walk, and it shows in your witness. You first came to Jesus, you, all you wanted to do was be in church and worship him, and you didn't care who, so you just wanted to worship him. Or with your walk, you just wanted to please God and obey him above all things. You didn't care what culture said. You didn't care what, you just wanted to walk upright with him. Or witness, you just wanted to tell everybody about how awesome Jesus was. But somewhere along the line, we get, in, we get religious, we get into routine, and life just happens. And those things become less important than they used to be. But yet we read in the scripture that those are the most important things. So if this is your fire, how would this fire go out? Because your flame can grow into a flicker. And your passion can actually dwindle and you can leave your passion. So let's talk about the process. So first of all, if, if, if you're, you know, we do this in West Virginia, everyone has a fire pit in the backyard. We like to sit around it. And, and we're simple people, right? Doesn't take a lot to entertain us. We sit there, we stare at the fire, we have marshmallows. And, and as long as you're adding fuel to the fire, the fire is going to do what? Burn. But the moment you stop and you start withdrawing fuel from this fire, what's going to happen? That fire is going to start to dwindle, and that fire is going to start to what? Die. The moment you stop 
adding fuel. See, you, you will fuel your passion and you'll reap the benefits from that, but we need to keep adding fuel to the fire. Here's the first step of the process to go to lose your fire and lose your passion. The first step is called idolatry. Now, I know what you're thinking. I would never bow down to a statue. I would never bow down to an idol. And if, if, you, did, if you wanted notes, you didn't get those when you came in. If you wave at a hostel, make sure you get those. You can follow along and take notes. But no one would have an idol in their closet. Uh, we probably wouldn't show up at your house and you'd be over there, I worship you, great statue. No one would do that. But here's what idolatry really is. It's just stubbornness. It means you're seeking gods instead of God. And you may not bow down to an actual statue or an idol, but so many times in our life, we just let stuff and priorities, and, and it could be people, it could be a habit, it could be a person, it, it could be, uh, it doesn't always mean it's a bad thing, but there's just stuff that becomes priority. See, that one time you were so passionate, and all that mattered was Jesus, but now there's some other idols, and you've become a little more stubborn and you're seeking some other things more than you're actually seeking God. And we all can be guilty of having idolatry in our life. It's not a, it's not a real common word in our culture. It was like I said, no one's bowing down like they do in some cultures to a statue. But we bow down to some things. And they're not always bad things. There's been times in my life, for just for example, that it wasn't necessarily something bad. But there's been times in my life when God actually spoke to me and said, quit watching so much TV. Is TV bad? No. But I have a tendency to sit down on the couch for 10 minutes and catch the end of something. And six hours later, I've watched a marathon on the Animal Channel and wasted six hours of my life. And I'm full of useless information, basically. That's, that's how it works. So, you, are you with me? You can have something. There's actually a time in my life when God actually spoke to me because I, I was just working out and doing all that stuff. And it was taking so much time. They got to tell me back off of it. Now, exercise, working out, it's good. It's not a bad thing, but, but it, maybe it's golf. Or maybe it's something. But it sort of can become an idol. And the only reason why the devil uses it, it just replaces our focus and our worship. Because idolatry will always injure your worship. Not all of a sudden you're in church a little less. You're in the Bible a little less. Just a little less time for God. It's not that you would ever look at God and say, talk to the hand, I'm out of here, I'm leaving you. But somehow it just, think about your, your, your marriage. When you first got married, you're dating, you got married, you just wanted to be with them all the time. And then this time went on, you're like, yeah, it's kind of good to be away from them a little bit, right? And then you, you, you go on and you, you just, you don't talk about them as much. You just, you, you, are you with me? Just routine in life. And the intimacy just starts to, it's not what it once was. All because of other things. So maybe what idols are you allowing in your life? Now, if you work out, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, what's the priority? What's the perspective? Because some of watching a game or some TV was taking my worship time. Are y'all with me? The first step is idolatry. The, the, second, the second way that you would put a fire out. So let's say you, you, you started withdrawing fuel. And, and, and now it's starting to dwindle a little bit. But idolatry always has a second step, and it's when you start to water the fire down. And when you start to water that fire down, that's called compromise. And when you start watering the fire down, what's going to happen? It's going to start to smolder. So it may start with idolatry, a little stubbornness, a little seeking other things more than God, and then idolatry actually becomes compromise. And compromise was going to cause conflict in your walk with God. Some things before, they just started compromising some small areas, and over time, it starts to weaken you. And just let me, let me say this to you, because I've said this before, but if there are things in your life, and you won't confront them, they're not going to change. If there are things in your life that you've just started to tolerate, that maybe you never would have tolerated before or allowed before, it's called compromise. You see, we're talking about the process of leaving our first love. No one's gonna wake up and be like, I'm just gonna leave my first love. But slowly it can happen. Our worship gets injured, now our walk. There's just some areas of compromise. Come on, are, are y'all hearing me? I've been there, you've been there. And John's writing this church and he's saying, hey, you're still serving? I get it, it's awesome. You're taking notes, it's awesome, you're growing. 
You're standing up, you're not giving in the culture, but your intimacy with me, it's not where it should be. You know, God's a jealous God, and he, he's jealous of our time, he's jealous of our worship. So when we start to allow compromise, see, here's the deal, when you start to allow compromise, you start to make what? Excuses for your compromises. Now, I'm not saying we're walking around judging everything, but what, what in your heart made me have you allowed to compromise? Because, see, these are steps. No one goes from step A to step C. You go A, B, and C. And just because we let some other things seeking God, seeking things more than God, then, then we just start to, we start to let areas of compromise. And they're just little things. But the little things start to what? Weaken. And how I many you know if you feed some little things, they grow and they don't stay little anymore? Areas of compromise. And I'm not here to give you a list of your compromise. You know what your list of compromise is. You know, maybe you, you, you've compromised in, in your integrity. You, you've compromised your time with God. You've compromised your, your church. You know, they used to say this that, and I know I've said this before, but they said it, the average person attended church two to three times a week. Within 10, 15, 20 years, the average attender now is maybe twice every six weeks. Now, that's not to say you can't ever have a Sunday off. Or that. I'm not saying that. It's a different culture. You know, we, we can watch live stream. We can watch recordings. But, but think about this. If, 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 if I just quit telling my wife I love you, and I, and I just put it on video, I said, hey, it's online. Just go upload it. Anytime you want to see it, it's there. He just, and I look at you, I love you. <laughs> I mean, no, but that's nice, but it's not the same. Amen? <laughs> Or if there were just some areas of compromise, and it, it grows. And, and here's the third, the, the, the final stage would be this. If you wanted to put a fire out, you're going to start withdrawing fuel. You're going to start to water things down, or you can finally put this fire out with just dirt. Well, what's there? There's just, it can be sin. So the first step of this process is idolatry, then it's compromise, and finally, it's adultery. And I'm not talking about marital adultery. I'm talking about a spiritual adultery the Bible says can happen in our lives. But let's compare it to a marriage. No one just wakes up and says, I'm gonna abandon my wife. But it just, it, it, it can start with you, with your wife, seeking some other things more than your spouse. Then there's a little bit of compromise that you wouldn't have thought you would have had and you excuse your behavior and eventually it's a full-blown adulterous situation. And spiritually that can happen to us. And then adultery starts to annihilate your witness. And Jesus said this, I will remove your lampstand. What did he mean? He's saying, if this happens in your church and in a believer's life, I'll remove your influence. I'll remove your effectiveness. Hey, for life point, I don't want our lampstand to be removed. In your life, I don't want your influence, your effectiveness to be removed. I want you to think about this scenario. It's a young couple, they're in their 20s, they meet each other, God puts them together, let's say, and they fall in love, and they're passionately in love. They're, they're, they're that couple we talked about. You know the couple that always made you sick because they're just they're perfect and they're in love, you and they're soulmates or whatever. They're just in love, right? And I know you're thinking, yeah, that's us. But you, you're, you're, so they're in love. Their relationship progresses. There's a night where he sets it up. He takes her out. He gets down on one knee, gives her a ring, asks her to marry him. She says, yes. Now they're, they're engaged. They, they, they have this beautiful ceremony. They're married. They're in the honeymoon stage. Everything's awesome. They're greater than you could have thought. And then life starts happening. Time starts happening. And things are good, but they're just not like as passionate as it was. And then let's say um, one day the husband comes home from work, and as he walks in the door, his wife is in the bathroom, and she's getting ready, and she's got her dress on, her hair, and she's doing her makeup, and he realizes that she's going out, and he's like, oh my gosh, did I forget our anniversary? Was it her birthday? Do we have plans with somebody? And, and finally, he says, where are we going tonight? She says, oh, I'm going out. He's like, oh, I thought we were going out. no. Oh, he's thinking maybe with some friends. So he says, well, who are you going with? She says, oh, I'm going out with John tonight. We're, we're going out for dinner and dancing. He's like, wait a minute. Who's John? Oh, that's just an old boyfriend from high school. 
Uh, okay, well, you can't do that. Well, why not? I always go out with some old boyfriends from high school. How many know that's not how it works? How many, when you get to that place, there's a different commitment, right? There's a different, I know that's a silly example, but I wonder if Jesus is ever waiting for some worship or waiting for some witness or waiting for some time with us and we, we got another date. We, we, we got another priority. We got something else to worship. We got something else to do. And he's thinking, but we have a covenant. We have a relationship. Here's the deal. Idolatry eventually becomes adultery. No, it doesn't happen overnight. But it's a process. And a process can be deceptive. And it can happen slow. Any of us can go from passion to leaving our passion. Here's the awesome thing about Jesus. He not only shared this problem, but he shared the solution. Y'all wanna know what the solution is? So the process is just things become idols, creates compromise, and eventually adultery. But Jesus gave what I call fireproofing your passion, and he said this in 2 Timothy. He said, you've got to stir up the flames. Fan into flame. You gotta stir up the fire of God in you. Everybody say stirred up. That means you gotta get a hold of some things and get them stirred up in you. Because let's face it, sometimes we just get to a place where we follow our feelings, but our feelings have been created by our compromise or what we've tolerated or our, what we've worshiped. So Jesus told John, he said, tell them these three things, they'll stir the fire back up. And one was this, he said, first of all, we just read it, said, you got to remember. The King James said, remember your first works. What that means is remember the activities at first. Everybody say remember. What he's saying is think back to what made you passionate. Think back when you first came to Jesus and you didn't care about anything else but what? Pleasing God, worshiping God. You didn't care what other, thing, other people thought. If God told you to do something, you did it. If God told you to witness, you witnessed you wanted everyone to know about this Jesus that you came to meet. So Jesus said, you gotta remember what the passion was like. In your marriage, there are every once in a while, how many know you gotta remember? Yeah. You, you, you gotta, re it's gonna sound wrong, and I don't mean it this way, but you gotta remember why you fell in love with them in the first place. Yeah. Here, here's the deal. It's interesting that God says remember, because we have a tendency to forget. Problems, life, processes, cause us to forget the important things. And Jesus told John, he said, tell them to remember what they did at first. You know, my heart for LifePoint would be that we would never be a church that Jesus had to send an email and said, you guys are awesome, awesome word, awesome worship, great people serving, but nonetheless, y'all have left your first love. Not an email I want tomorrow morning. And so I remember when we first came here, me and my wife, we left the church of 3,000 people. We came to church of like 20 people, but we were so excited because God said, do it. And we came, and a lot of you weren't here then, and we just started praying. We started worshiping. We started working on things, creating a lot of a fire and enthusiasm and excitement. And I said something for several months. If you were here, you'll remember me saying this. I said, you need to come. You need to come often, and you need to not come alone. And so the church was very passionate. I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm just saying, looking back, Let's not lose, we were so hungry to worship, so hungry to get the word. Yeah. Let's not get in a routine and let's not get too familiar and too comfortable that we compromise those things. Yeah. I even remember in, in, in my life, and it, you, this might make you laugh, but uh, as Savannah said, every Thursday, God just told me to do this. So come in with our team. I teach on something, we go over something, we study something, we pray. That's what we do on Thursday mornings at AMP. And so um, a few weeks ago, we, we've been walking through Ephesians together and the first several chapters of Ephesians is talking about our position in God and everything God's done in us. And I started thinking about all the good stuff in the book of Ephesians, then in Revelations, it's saying, but they left their first love. All of Ephesians is about the grace of God, the goodness of God, our position in Christ, our weapons, but yet they left their first love. And so I, I, I told our, our guys, I said, what's your go-to song? Here's what I mean by go-to song. What's a worship song or a song that takes you to a place where you remember when you first came to Jesus, 
To me, it was like, why did I first come to Jesus? Why did, why, why did I first get into ministry? And so we all just played a part of our song that day. And, and I have this little playlist, because every once in a while, because here's what happens. I go, when I'm done here on Sundays, I quit and I retire. Usually I come back on Monday morning, I'm good to go. But by Sunday afternoon, there's just some days. And, it, 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 and, and, and sometimes I gotta just stir the fire up. And so there's this song from like the 90s probably. It, it, it's an old band called Jeff Moore in the Distance and a song called You're My Foundation. And that's my go-to. Because every once in a while I gotta remember why I started this, why I've stayed with him, how good he's been to me. And to me, through all the ups and downs and the comings and goings, it's about the fact that he is a foundation. That's my go-to. They all had their different go-to. And every go-to has a story. But think about your life. See, there was a time when you were passionate. And if a pastor walked up and said, we're going to give an offering to this ministry, and you're like, or we're going to go on this mission trip. I'm going. Or we're going to do this. Let's go. But life goes on a little bit, and we get <clears throat> dignified. A little less obedient, a few more excuses. And we have a few more reasonings. And Come on, are you with me? Jesus said, tell them to remember the first part, the basics. And then he said, didn't you move on from remembering? And what do you do next? You repent. And this word repent, it's a scary looking word, but it's really not that scary. But let me put it this way. Saying you're sorry is not enough. The story we just used of the girl who kept going out with the boyfriends, what if every time she's like, well, I'm really sorry, but she did it again. Well, you know, what's the saying? Trick me once, fool me, whatever that is. <laughs> so I'm sorry is not enough. Repent means this, to create an inward change that creates outward changes. In other words, it does start with remorse. God, I am sorry, but I repent. In other words, there's gotta be real proof Repent it means to change course, change direction. To keep doing the same things and expecting a different turnout or result is what they say is insanity. To keep tolerating the same things and wanting a different outcome, that's insane. Remember, repent, and the last thing he says is to redo. He said to redo the original actions. So just think about this. Because passion, that original passion, are you as hungry for the things of God as you once were? Are you as willing to serve God and do whatever he asks as you once were? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you humble enough to change? Are you humble enough to grow? Are you full of enough love that you would forgive, that you would give? I mean, that, that's what passion is. It's the basics. It's the nuts and it's the bolts. He says, remember, repent, and redo what you did at first. You know, if you and your spouse, if your relationship grows a little stale, you need to start doing some of the things that you did at first to what? Rekindle the fire. Guys, remember when you were first trying to win her over? You would always like call her, text her. You would plan a date. You would spend some money on her. You would shower. You would look good. You would wash the car. Remember when you used to wash the car? A little time goes by. You don't shower as much as you used to. You look a little nastier than you used to. You don't care if the car is clean or not. You got the picture. What would you do that you did at first? Especially in the age of Pinterest. To pull off the engagement question is so much pressure now. Used to be you rolled up to Mickey D's, you said, here's a Happy Meal, would you like to go steady and marry me? And like, yes. Now it's like, you know, you gotta have the lights, you gotta have the cameras, you know, it's on Facebook, you know, you, you got the you know, photographer following, you know, you know, it's just a big deal today. I'm kidding, but, but, but what did you do at first? Jesus said, tell them to do that again. Worship like you did at first. Witness like you did at first. In other words, become more intimate like you were at first. Now, l listen to this. When, when Jesus told John to write this letter, he said, do the first works that you did. It means the first activities. But that phrase, I love this, it means creative activity. So what Jesus was telling John, it's actually where we get the idea that a poet is very creative with writing his poems. 
And so really what this means is get creative with kindling the fire. Make it a creative activity to find ways to worship him, to be in church, to get whatever that means. It's what it means, creative. Creative activity. I guess what I'm saying is when you were first macking on her, guys, you were pretty creative because you were trying to win her over. And when you won her over, you're not very creative anymore. You're horrible, actually. Because it was those things that impressed her. Now, I'm not saying you're trying to impress God, but I'm just saying how creative is your worship or how full of adultery is your worship? How creative is your walk or how full of compromise is your walk? How creative is your witness or how adulterous has your walk, your witness become? Let's all stand.